This interview was recorded on April 20th, 2021. Hi, I'm Len Epp from Lean Pub, and in this episode of the Front Matter Podcast, I'll be interviewing Eric Mathis. Based in Alaska, Eric is a former high school math and science teacher who is now a full-time writer and programmer. Eric is the author of the book Python Crash Course from No Starch Press, which is the best-selling introductory book about the Python programming language in the world. You can follow him on Twitter at E-H Mathis, and that's M-A-T-T-H-E-S, and check out his website at ehmathis.com. Eric recently published his beginner's Python cheat sheets on LeanPub. These cheat sheets are an invaluable resource for anyone learning Python and have been downloaded over 1.5 million times by people all around the world. In this interview, we're going to talk about Eric's background and career, professional interests, his book, and his experience as a best-selling author. So thank you, Eric, for being on the Front Matter podcast. You're welcome, and thank you for the invitation. I always like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin story. So I was wondering <laughs> if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up and how you first became interested in programming. Yeah, origin story is a good word, good phrase. I grew up in Nashua, New Hampshire, which is outside of Boston. Um, my origin story relevant to this um, story probably starts with um, learning to program. So my dad was a software engineer in the 60s and 70s. And so he worked at a number of the different companies on that um, strip between Boston and New Hampshire. Um, my first experience with a computer was uh, watching my dad build a kick computer in the late 70s in our basement. And it was an unfinished basement, and it kind of matched the feel of this unfinished computer. Uh, it was just a bare keyboard without a case and a cathode ray tube without a case um, and some chips laying around. And so I, my first program was a number guessing game in basic on that setup. So it's kind of like the Raspberry Pi of the 70s. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry to jump in there, but actually this is, this is a question I've asked a lot of guests on the podcast because so many of our guests, of our authors have been um, you know, into programming and stuff like that. And so many, I can't tell you how many people it's like, it's from a parent, you know, often, often yes. their father introducing to it, them to them as, as a kid. But uh, one of the really common experiences that people had around, around the era that I'm guessing you were getting going uh, was that they, their first programs were from magazines and they would, they would type it out into the, into the computer. Is that what you did? No. Um, I remember sitting at my dad's computer and, you know, being happy that he was letting me touch it. Uh, and him just telling me, um, I don't remember how he taught me. The first real memory I have is trying to make that number guessing game, thinking it was going to work and then trading seat, trading the seat, asking my parents to sit where I was sitting me standing up and watching them and seeing that this game that I had created worked. And so it's one of the simplest games you can write as a programmer, but I still remember that feeling of watching somebody else play a game that I had written and seeing it work. That's really amazing. And did you continue programming throughout your, your youth growing up? I did. You know, now that we're talking about that again, um, the other visceral memory is going into digital, digital equipment corporation um, and playing on deck terminals. And there's a terminal invaders game and I just remember on those old clicky keyboards um, playing that. And so I, I am jealous of people who get to learn programming today because of how many resources they have at their fingertips. But I'm also grateful to have learned it back when we were much closer to um, the lower level architecture. And uh, jumping ahead to university, I believe you studied physics. Yes. Yeah. So your question was, did I continue to program? Um, I did off and on. It was always something that I was curious about and fascinated with. And so I enjoyed learning a variety of languages. And so some of it's a little hazy about when exactly I learned it and how. Um, but I ended up with some exposure to C, Pascal, um, Fortran, and a couple others thrown in there. So yeah, I... Um, I had a really good chemistry class in high school. And so I thought I was going to be a chemical engineer because um, I enjoyed chemistry. I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to apply this in the world. And I got to university and I had to take a physics class. And I found that taking physics classes alongside engineering classes, the engineering classes seemed like solving other people's problems. And the physics classes seemed about to be about understanding how the world worked. And so as a, an older teenager, um, I was just super curious about how the world worked and physics kind of got at the heart of that. And actually, since since pedagogy is going to be an important part of our discussion, I think um, I recall mm -hmm. from uh, I listened to a couple of interviews that you've done in the not too recent and the not too distant past um, uh, when I was preparing for this interview. And I believe you learned you had a very important lesson that you learned from that chemistry teacher that you kept with you. Uh, <laughs> Am I just like, it was something about learning how to learn or something like that. 
Yeah, there's a few teachers that stand out. And what I remember from that chemistry teacher, I feel really fortunate. It was six people in that class. And I went to a high school that had about 2,000 people in it. So the idea of having a double class period for um, every day for a year with six people was just such a quality learning experience. And the teacher had a reputation of being really difficult. Um, but it, it wasn't... Um, him making the work difficult, it was him exposing us to challenging work um, and being confident that we could learn it. Um, and so he was one of the first people that made me want made me want to work really hard to learn something that wasn't easy for me. Yeah, that's really great. It's it, it's um, it, I can imagine as a teacher, maybe we'll talk a little bit about this about this going forward. But you know, particularly the bigger a class gets, the ability to reach every student would be you know just this kind of I don't know exponential problem. Um, but so you sorry yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely less personal the bigger a class is. Yeah, and and so and so you you studied physics, uh, but you didn't you didn't carry on in physics. No, I wanted to be a particle physicist because I was trying to figure out like what is the the most core way that I can understand the universe. Um, but I also knew that I didn't want to be a student into my thirties, and so I wanted to do something outside of um, being a student for a while. And so this was the early 90s. I graduated in 1994. And so I was looking for what I could do for a while while figuring out whether I wanted to go to graduate school. And physics is interesting in that it is one of those gatekeeper classes. So it's a class that everybody in engineering and, and physical sciences has to take. Not everybody likes it. Um, and yeah, it's used as a gatekeeper class. And so as a 19-year-old who understood it, um, I got involved with a tutoring group. And so I did volunteer tutoring for several years in college. And it was a really humbling and eye-opening experience to tutor people younger than myself, people my own age, and people much older. So we were tutoring people in their 40s and 50s who were going back to school. Um, and it's, that's a really interesting experience for somebody that age. Um, and I always appreciated people basically being vulnerable. If you go to volunteer tutor, you're saying, I need help. Um, and I sure had respect and learned from the humility that people brought to that. So that got me interested in teaching. And so uh, I ended up um, deciding to teach for a while outside of college. And I found that the intellectual challenge of trying to reach everybody in a class was as satisfying as uh, the intellectual challenge of hard science. And uh, then you taught for a while in New York, I believe. I did. Um, I taught for seven years. I taught four years middle school science. Um, and then I left for a little while, lived on a bicycle for a year. Uh, and then I went back and taught math for three years uh, and then realized I couldn't live away from Alaska anymore. And I moved here. Uh, yeah, just before we move on to uh, talk, there will be a little bit of a really fun tangent where we talk about, I think, your, your, your biking. Um, uh, yeah. But uh, before we do that, there's a question that I'm really looking forward to asking you because I, 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 it comes up pretty often on the, on the podcast. But as someone who you know, teaches, um, if you were starting out now or if there was a young you starting out, you know, having just graduated high school now, who wanted to pursue a career in programming, would you advise your newly minted 2021 18 year old self to get a four year degree in computer science at university or try to use all those tools and things that you mentioned are available and resources that are available to people now to say, avoid the student debt or something like that. Boy, I was thinking about this podcast today and wondering what hard questions you would ask. And that's <laughs> the first real hard one. Um, I don't have a clear answer. I can say that college was a really, really good experience for me. Um, I feel fortunate to have avoided the student debt um, issue that was starting to really grow around that time. Um, I went to a state school and I chose that because I recognized that I didn't have specific enough goals to justify a higher private um, tuition. And so my core advice would be to be mindful of um, the obligations and debts that you're taking on. Um, there's a there's a trend in the tech industry right now to um, kind of look down on college because when it's do not done well, it's a terrible burden for people. Um, but four years of studying computer science um, really, if it's done well, gives you a good understanding of how computers work and how not just the computers, the machines themselves, but the logic 
on the foundations of how things work. As I said earlier, I feel grateful to have first learned programming back in the 70s. That was when we learned we manage memory ourselves. And so I wasn't thinking about it much as an eight-year-old. Um, but as I um, started to learn more about programming, we had to think consistently about how memory was being managed. And so you don't need that to start out now, but when things get difficult, uh, that basic understanding um, is really helpful. And so people who do a good four-year degree, not necessarily expensive, not necessarily at an elite institution, but people who do a good four-year learning experience get that foundation that that does tend to pay off in the end. And it's really interesting um, because um, unlike maybe in other subjects, if you're going to start, if you're starting out in computer science, if you haven't, if you don't already already have experience like with the actual thing tools that you're going to be using, and then you get hit with hit with theory, you have this kind of double challenge where you have to just figure out how to set things up in addition to actually that before you can even start really even trying to, to do the exercises or whatever that you have to do to figure out the theoretical issues. Yeah, I think, you know, um, the work that you can do related to any of this is so broad and there's so many options that there's room for people who have done computer science programs and there's room for people who just know a basic level of programming, what you do need if you're thinking about doing this professionally is the mindset of, uh, what I, the way I always say this is people are not paying you to write code, people are paying you to solve problems. And so if you are just out of high school and you already have that mindset of, I'm going to use what I have learned so far to help people solve problems, then you can probably go straight into some kind of work. Um, yeah, you just have more tools the more you learn to be able to do that. Yeah, and I think I think there might be actually a, a sort of sort of um, subtle but very important point in that that really um, good piece of advice, right? That that you're when you're working as a programmer, your job is to solve problems for people who have them. It's not it's not necessarily to use the language that you already know or to write as much code as you can in the shortest period of time. We've we've got a bit of a saying at at Lean Pub, which is like people who abandon book projects early on because they're not getting feedback when they otherwise wouldn't have known for three years, that's actually a really excellent outcome. And if, if a client right. you and you can solve their problem without writing a line of code, <laughs> you, know, you, <laughs> might, you might become their favorite, uh, <laughs> their favorite person to hire. Right. Um, and so uh, I mentioned that there, we would be going on a bit of a tangent. And so you, you mentioned rather yes. modestly that you lived on a bike for a year, but you, uh, I believe you lived continuously on a bike for, for um, is it 13 months or something like that at one point. And you, and you, you basically cycled all around the United States and all the way up into Alaska as well. Yeah, I basically circled North America. Um, I worked at a camp in the White Mountains in New Hampshire uh, during college. And I read a book at that time called A Walk Across America. And there's a guy named Peter Jenkins. Um, and he had graduated college and wasn't sure what to do and wanted to know his country and his people. And so he set off from New York and he walked down to Louisiana and then up to, I think, the coast of Oregon. Um, and I liked that idea of seeing the land and meeting people um, unpowered, but walking sounded too slow. Um, so I was already a bicyclist. And so when I, um, had been teaching for two years, it was the first time in my life where I had a summer off and no obligations. And so I ended up flying to Seattle and, and biking back to Maine, just one way across the U S and I liked it so much. I did it again the next summer across the Southern tier of the U S which was, um, much different. If you cross Northern North America in the summer, it's kind of a playground of lakes and mountains and a little bit hot and whatnot. Um, but if you go across the Southern U S in the summer, it's like 114 degree degree days in the desert and 95 plus in the Southeast with humidity. Um, so I like that as much for the challenge and I wanted to live for a full year outside and feel the seasons and, and just, just commit to that lifestyle. So, um, I quit my job and started in Seattle and I went, um, across uh, to Michigan, Great Lakes area, and then up into Canada, as far as you can go on a road in northeastern Canada, uh, to a town called Shibugumu, uh, and then down into Maine, and down to Florida, over to California, and up to Alaska. So, 
which is just an amazing accomplishment. And yeah, there, there, I should mention there's there's a book that you wrote back in the day called The Road to Alaska that people can can still get on Amazon yes. or, or anywhere else you can find it. And I just I just have a couple of questions. I mean, I'm sure you've been getting this your whole life ever since you did it. But so so <laughs> so you were so you you would camp. You, you said being outside. So you would you presumably had a tent with you that you would set up whenever you were ready to um, end end the day. Yeah, I had uh, camping gear and some food and clothes, and I just woke up in the morning and had had a pop tart. Um, got on the bike and rode, and um, I mixed making my own food and stopping in restaurants. And if you're traveling alone, stopping in restaurants is kind of nice because you get to meet people and talk to people, and um, it's where a lot of those interactions happen. Um, most of the time, you can find a place to camp out uh, between towns. There's a few places where that's challenging, um, but if you're comfortable asking people, um, living on a bicycle is fairly non-threatening. Um, so most people were pretty pretty happy to help and point in a direction or or offer something. Yeah, thank you for offering that up spontaneously. That <laughs> the question, that was going to be my next question, and I'm sure it's the one you got you get a lot when you tell people about it. Um, you know, when if there's some stranger on a bike shows up and says, "Can I sleep in your farmyard?" You know, right. It's a, probably a bit different than if someone rolled up in a big truck and said, "Can I set up?" My right. <laughs> yes, but you know that. So that was uh, mid '90s when I did that, and back then people told me, "You can't do that today. You could do that 20 years ago, but it's not safe." Um, and I feel like there's probably people today who would say, "You can't do that now. You could do that in the '90s when you did it, but it's not safe." Um, <clears throat> I have hoped to do that again in my. 50s or 60s, because um, I kind of want to test that idea of how much has changed. Clearly, a lot has changed, but I feel like people are the same. Um, so yeah, I hope to do it again and see what's changed. That would be it's interesting. Uh, sorry. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring this up. I, I haven't actually spoken that, about that trip for a while. And in the context of, you know, do we go to college? How do we think about that? That was a time in my life where people were pushing me to go back and do a master's. Um, either in science or in education. And a lot of my peers were doing that. And I chose to do this instead because I felt like living outside for a year was going to teach me as much as doing a master's program was. Um, and I really, you know, the 20 year perspective, I feel like it did. It was such a grounding experience. Um, I met people from all walks of life and learned what I needed to. And, you know, a lot of you know, if we circle around to writing at some point, a lot of it is just about perseverance. And so that idea of like, how do you bike 10,000 miles? You get up each day and you bike a mile. So, yeah, the, the the part of the story and one of the reasons that I was really looking forward to talk to you about it was that, that, that really that really grabs me. And it's because of my personality type, the idea of just like heading off in a direction and not knowing where I'm going to stay that yes. day. Like that's just yeah. something that I would, I would in, unless I learned to, deal with it, I would just be preoccupied with it until the very moment that I had my, you know, tent stakes in the ground. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a freeing feeling and it's a scary feeling. And whenever I've ended those trips, it is always nice in some ways to not wonder where I'm going to sleep each night. I think, I think that would be an absolute, assuming it's still safe, I think that would be an absolutely fascinating project to try it again and see what things would be like. I mean, would you be looking at your Google Maps all the time or would you choose not to right. do it? There'd be so many interesting decisions to make that way, right? Yeah, I did it before smartphones. And so I had a paper map of each state and I would just figure out where I wanted to finish each state or province um, and then pick the least traveled path I could find to that other side of the, the state or province. Um, and yeah, I'm glad I didn't have satellite pictures to look at. <laughs> yeah. Actually speaking just before we move on, um, since you're mentioning states and provinces, was there, did it, I mean, Canada's a big place. The United States is a big place. Did you find there was any kind of generic difference between the people you encountered on one side of the border versus the other? It was interesting when I was in Canada, people were very warm and welcoming, um, as they were most of, most of the land, most of North America. Um, people would close up a little bit when they learned that I was American. Um, and it was always very subtle. Um, but yeah, noticeable. It happened. Um, I love Canada. Um, I have lived probably six months in Canada just from different trips. Um, yeah. 
big big topic there yeah no it is <laughs> it is yeah. where we live <laughs> yeah no it is it is um uh yeah the the only thing i guess i would i've spent a fair amount of time in the states and the one one thing i've observed is that Americans are much more likely to strike up a conversation with a stranger if you're sitting at a bar or something like that than than right. Canadians are, and they're much oh. less likely to be offended if you don't if you don't if you're unwilling if you don't if you just don't want to talk to them, right? So if a Canadian kind of went across that vast gulf to t- start talking to a stranger sitting next to them, and that person just said, "I don't want to talk right now," they'd never forget it in my stereo <laughs> image. But an American might go. You know, did you see the game last night? And if someone goes, man, I just don't want to talk right now, they'd be no problem. <laughs> just carry on. But anyway, um, we could, yeah, we could, we could talk about those kinds of things forever. Um, and so, yeah, so you, so you went on this massive epic journey and in, in the end it took you to Alaska and then you decided to move there. Um, yes. Did you have a job lined up before you moved? No. Um, you know, when I was single, I, I cooked every night. I could live on beans and rice and pasta with spaghetti sauce every other night for life. Um, so I kept my cost fairly low um, and it wasn't too hard to pick up and, and move around. So I did come here without a job. Um, also, to be honest, being a math and science teacher means that you can find a job pretty much anywhere. Um, so I, I did know people. I moved here because I had met people in Glacier National Park um, who were biking and then moving here. So I called them up when it was time to move here and said, Hey, can I come visit? And they're like, yes, come join us. So I stayed with them for a month and then got on my feet here. That's really fantastic. And actually that's a nice stop. It gives us a good opportunity to move on to the next part of the podcast where since last March, we've started asking people about uh, how the pandemic has affected them where they live uh, and, and their work as well. And actually you live in a particularly unique, unique place. So if you could explain a little bit about where you're situated and, and how life has affected people in your area. Yes. Um, I live in Sitka in Southeast Alaska. And like many people here, I thought I would come here for one year and then figure out where I really wanted to be in Alaska. Um, But Southeast is gorgeous. We have big mountains. We're right next to the ocean. Um, Most people have some sort of subsistence lifestyle where we catch our own fish and and hunt and uh, gather berries in the summer. Um, And so it feels like a pretty connected place. And so Sitka is a town of about 10,000 people on Baranoff Island. Baranoff Island is 100 miles north-south and about 20 miles east-west. So our town is a tiny strip of land um, on the western edge of of a 100-mile island. And we have 14 miles of road. And so one of the things to do sometimes is just drive from end, from the sign that says end to the other sign that says end. (laughs) Um, And it takes about half an hour. Um, So you were asking how the last year has been. And... It was kind of scary going into pandemic year here because it could be very nice to be in an isolated place during a pandemic. Um, and it could be pretty brutal to be in an isolated place. And Alaska has a fairly recent history uh, in the last hundred years of, of suffering pretty, pretty hard times, uh, generational loss during uh, both pandemic and, and disease brought from um, explorers, um, to put it to put it quite broadly. Um, So it woke up fairly recent memories for a lot of people. Um, It has turned out well um, for a variety of reasons. We have, we had a small outbreak over winter that kept all of our schools remote for a while, um, but we did not have a serious outbreak. Um, And yeah, I deeply appreciate the things that our people in our community have done to, um, to make that happen. Yeah, thanks a lot for that, and particularly for drawing those historical connections. Those are those are so important to to keep in mind with with things like this. And so uh, you found a job that is teaching math and science. Yes, uh, yes. Sitka, and um, and then you still had a programmer in you. Um, and I, yes. I got you, you. You sometimes got to teach programming at the school where you taught, but eventually you found yourself going to a Python conference. Yes. Yeah, okay, the, this is a story of our lives today, right? Um, the full story is that uh, my father died in 2011, um, a month after my son was born. And so that was a pretty, pretty jarring experience. Um, and one of the things that I did um, when spending a week with my mom 
uh, was to go through my dad's computer. Uh, she asked me to go through his computer and tell her if there were any uh, anything that she be, should be aware of on that, anything she should preserve or reach out to people about. Um, and so as a really personal um, way to kind of reconnect with my dad one last time, because um, every time I visit him, we talk about programming and our various work. Um, and I saw all these projects that would never see the light of day because he was waiting until they were good enough to share. And so I realized that um, that I had developed meaningful programming skills and that while my teaching was going well and I was doing good things with it, um, programming is a fairly valuable skill and I should start to think about whether there was anything that I could do with that more meaningfully. And so that led me to come back here and try to figure out a project to focus on. Um, so as a hobbyist programmer, I had always just kind of dabbled. Um, I remember reading Chaos by, I think it was James Gleick. And there was a piece in there about how you can build uh, ferns, images of ferns from a sim some simple mathematical rules. And so I would like read a chapter like that and then close the book and go write a short program that tries to, to build a fern. Um, and that was the extent of a lot of my projects. Um, and so, yeah, that experience of going through my dad's computer led me to say, what's a meaningful project that I can carry all the way through to it meaningfully impacting other people. And um, yeah, and so you, you, um, you went to this conference and you, I think one thing you realized there was that there were a lot of other people there like you, right? Who wasn't, it, everybody wasn't a, you know, sort of like cutting edge, big company Python programmer. There were a lot of people there who wanted, wanted to learn. Yeah, so PyCon was super interesting. I um, was fortunate enough to to be at a school where we were encouraged to travel and go to conferences. And I had been to math teacher conferences and whatnot. And so I said, I like to go to a programming conference and just kind of see what's there. And so I was super intimidated. I expected to go be surrounded by people who are only focused on programming. And I have found every year that I've gone to PyCon that it seems to be about half of the people there are mainly programmers and they're kind of looking for what pro problems to solve and problems to focus on. And about half the people seem to be people from other areas with domain expertise who are looking to use programming to, fo to better address their problems that they're trying to solve. Um, so yeah, I instantly felt accepted and welcomed um, and just kind of blew my mind about all the different directions I could go uh, to do meaningful work. And yeah, moving on to the next part of the interview where we talk about your book, uh, Python Crash Course. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to, I'd really like to hear the story of, of how this best-selling book got originated. And I, I believe partly it was, uh, you'd been trying to think about like, how can you really present a book or a process for beginners to get going uh, that doesn't treat them like children and doesn't assume too much yes. about what they know? Yeah, so that was 2013. And so I first went to PyCon in 2012 and the direction I was heading was to write software that would address the inefficiencies in education. And there are many. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, the mindset that I was coming from was um, the open source model. All right, so the open source model started as early as computers existed. So people think of 90s, 2000s around open source um, kind of being named and and developing that model, but all software was open when it first started, and then people started privatizing it and making money from it and building companies around software and closing up systems. Um, so I like to think about uh, Emacs and Vim. Uh, those are two open source editors written in the 70s that people still use to this day. Um, and the stories for both of those is that uh, people programmers were more interested in competing on more interesting ideas than just selling text editors. So people agreed to keep their, their tools open um, and compete on bigger and more interesting problems. And so the tools for writing software um, have been free and open for people for 50 years now. And so if you look at education, there's a lot of tools that are either low quality um, or really expensive and exclusionary. And so my big push was um, how can we take that mindset of building high quality open tools to let teachers do their jobs better and students learn better. Um, 
And so I, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say I, you're making a point, something I've thought about, not to the extent you have, but a fair amount about how basically proprietary software and education don't necessarily go together that well. Right. Well, I gave a lightning talk at PyCon in 2013 about these ideas, and I had some specific ideas for how to address this. And oh, man, um, as a teacher, giving a talk at a programming conference was so intimidating. I shouldn't say intimidating. It was just weird um, because I did a lightning talk the last day of the conference right before the closing event. And so there's 1,500 people in Santa Clara, California. And um, when I stand in front of a classroom, I'm totally comfortable. And my job is to like tell everybody, like pay attention to me for a few minutes. I've never been a super strict controlling teacher, um, but I um, make sure people respect me and people respect each other. And so uh, to stand up in front of 1500 people and half of them have their phones out and are on Twitter, and the other half have their laptops out and I can't say, put your devices away. Um, it was really, really weird to just start speaking with everybody looking down and whatnot. Um, but at one point in that five minute talk about these ideas, I said something along the lines of, um, proprietary software will never foster a revolution in education. Um, and people looked up and cheered. And I was like, wow, like they're listening and they, they get it. And this could go somewhere. Um, so, but it was really interesting because uh, after that talk, about 20 people uh, met me over at the side of the, the hall to kind of just dump their their educational stories. Um, and people think like if you have bad teachers, okay, like, Maybe that's not fun. Maybe you don't like school for a little while. Um, but bad educational experiences are traumatizing to people. And so half of those people were basically telling me how inefficiencies in education um, had traumatized them for a while. And that was their motivation for seeing these kinds of things be be developed. Yeah, I'd like to talk about this a little bit more, but just to jump in, actually, there was one from Paul. Sure podcast I listened to preparing for this uh, interview, one, one line, I'm going to quote you back at yourself, really stood out to me. I sure. think it was on, um, might have been on Will Vincent's Django Chat podcast. And you said something that like very much resonates with me, which is if you understand the world, people can take less advantage of you. Yes. Um, and when you talk about the cost of a poor education, yes. it's, it's very much, often people think, oh, well, you know, people who conflate education with job training, you know, they're like, oh, well, you, you know, you just pick up those skills elsewhere or later on or something like that. A poor education leaves you weaker just in life generally. And, you know, someone famous once said knowledge is power and they were right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's systemic. And so uh, some people are kept from uh, quality education. Many people are. Yeah. And so I, I just bring that up to say that like the, the, the importance of getting uh, of this subject of, of getting education right is, is about a lot more than, than we sort of all of us normally think in our day-to-day -day lives. And so I'm just trying to draw a connection between something that might sound kind of obscure, like a complaint about proprietary software right. and quality education. Like it's not a trivial matter or a snarky thing or like an anti-corporate thing. Like the example I always like to give when I talk about it, and this is usually in the context of talking about how LeanPub works, is like I have a, an academic background in English literature and at a certain level, you know, you're doing a lot of looking into historical texts sometimes. And I was doing this kind of, you know, I did my doctoral research at the beginning of the century. And um, at the time, and starting a few years before then, archiving texts for the sake of, you know, preserving knowledge for the future had become this huge issue, um, particularly in, and I'm just picking an example so that people will maybe get it, but like there used to be this thing called big ass laser discs. Um, <laughs> you remember those? So not, not I just, do, obscurely. <laughs> yeah, not CDs, but these big ass laser, they weren't called big ass laser discs, they were called laser discs. But anyway, uh, what happened was there was, but the, the, the technology to create them, the technology to produce them was owned by particular companies and they, you know, you, you had to have a particular way of reading the stored information in order to get it out and then translate it into something readable, basically. And so a lot of libraries invested a lot of money in digitizing their archives. But then when the Laserdisc format was, became something that people weren't using anymore, they now had all this, this useless archive and something that could degrade and things like that. And um, one, of the, one of the ways of preserving because if, in, in a way, text is the easiest one, right? Because we have in, in, in the computer world, there are formats that are universal and global and very clear, which is 
literally this set of ones and zeros is a lowercase a. Literally this right. set of ones and zeros is a lowercase b. And so once that, that standard is open, then anything written according to that standard can forever be interpreted one way or another. But if you're using, if you're storing it, not in plain text, like I'm describing, but if you store your text in like Microsoft Word, right? If you lose access to Microsoft Word or if Microsoft Word changes, right? Then you don't have that record of that text anymore. I'm putting it in a kind of like very high level way, but you can imagine when it comes to learning materials and stuff, and stuff like that, like having it behind something that can, is owned and can be controlled by any particular organization just inherently weakens it from the pur purpose of from the perspective of long-term education. All right, you're gonna fire me up again because um, the project that I spoke about at the time uh, that that conference was uh, a project that would open up education standards because in the education world, the education standards, uh, Common Core standards, National Council of Teachers of Mathematics standards, NCTM, um, any number of standards, next generation science standards, they're open and that everybody has access to them, but they all have these weird somewhat limiting licenses that keep ultimate control um, in the hands of a particular body. And all those standards have different structures. And some of them even have different structures within their own body. And so when you try to build lesson plans or build planning tools, curriculum tools, anything you build in education these days tends to be on top of those standards. And so that lack of consistency and that lack of openness um, means that everything else in education is inefficient and will need to be updated and possibly lost every few years. Oh, that's so interesting. So I did, I was misunderstood. So I was taking it from the sort of like totally like kind of straightforward sense of like, you know, technological standards and stuff like that. But what you're saying is that like, it's the, it's the kind of rules that you're allowed to go by that are kind of proprietary. Yeah, the standard of a student will be able to count to 100 by the end of grade one. Um, that's written one way by one body and a different way by another body. And it's at different levels in a hierarchy and any number of, of differences. And so every few years, those hierarchies change and the way they're phrased changed. And um, yeah, it, it's basically a, a system of perpetual obsolescence, which is what we see with your uh, story about the laser discs and beta, beta tapes before that and any number of file formats. Uh, over the years. Yeah. And uh, I'm trying to think of a segue from our very interesting digression mm -hmm. back to your book, but I guess it's, okay. yeah, yeah, I, I can the, give the, you that. The, 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 oh, really? Oh, great. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah. 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 So um, that talk is a five minute talk about how we should uh, develop open standards and how those open standards were similar to the idea of openness that was at the foundation of the whole computer industry going back many years. And so um, one of the people who came out to talk to me was Bill Pollack, who is the owner and founder of No Starch Press. And he basically said, um, I like the way you're talking about education. And if you're ever interested in writing a book, um, feel free to get in touch. And so I didn't want to write a book. Um, I wanted to, to build this open standards platform. Um, but I went back uh, to teaching after that conference when I got back to um, here, when I got back to Sitka and went back to my classroom, I saw a, a butcher paper um, list, handwritten list that I had put on the wall of my classroom that basically said, what's the least you need to know about programming um, to do interesting projects? And I looked at that and I was like, that is the table of contents of the book I should write. Because uh, this is 2013. And this is when all of the introductory books that existed um, made assumptions about what people knew. They A lot of the books kind of f fell into that mindset of if people aren't getting this, it's probably because of something they're doing wrong. Um, and I like the teaching mindset of, okay, if people aren't getting it, it's a fair chance it's something that I'm not doing right. I'm not explaining clearly. I'm not anticipating. Um, and the history of programming books is pretty interesting. First programming books uh, were just manuals. Um, when people started writing programming books, they were just written by programmers. Um, and then as the, the industry evolved, you started to have people who had some experience teaching 
starting to write some of the books. And so, yeah, I, I decided to write that book because um, I had wanted to give my students a book that they could learn from and not be tied to my pace when teaching. Um, because that's the story of programming too. Like you get into it and you're like, all right, like I have the power, I can control this computer. Um, but you know, people say, well, the internet, you can learn anything you want. Like, yes, if you can wade through the entire internet. Um, so a book is really good because if you can meet it where that book begins, then hopefully you can go all the way through that book and come out you know, basically a different person you know, with different abilities, different skills, different understanding. Um, but if the book leads you off track or if you get confused by something and can't get an answer, then you just kind of dumped out, dumped out of that book. So I watched my students get dumped out of every book that was available uh, because of things that, that they couldn't possibly know. And if you don't know if somebody is a programmer, you, you really couldn't get your question answered. Even with Stack Overflow, if you don't know to go there and don't know how to ask your question, you just cannot progress. And so, you know, in the classroom, my students were successful because I was that person who could answer their questions. But I could see that these books were not working for, uh, they were working for many people, but there was a whole class of people that they were not working for. So, um, yeah, I, you alluded to it, I think, earlier. I forget if I did or you did. But the, the guiding principle was um, what's the least you need to know about programming in order to start doing meaningful projects, because I feel like that's where people want to end up. Um, and the other part was I'm going to assume nothing about what you know as a programmer but I'm also not gonna treat you like a kid because my choices as a high school teacher when I first started this project were um, books that would respect my students as high school age people, but weren't written for them or kids books, which might work for them, but were would really be speaking down to them. And so, yeah, so that, that was my goal. Um, lofty goal, but um, with a focused approach. Yeah, and I mean, I've I've never written a book like that myself, but you know, working at LeanPub, I've seen I've seen a great many of them, and I've uh, you know, being a non programmer my, programmer myself who found myself in the kind of tech startup world a while ago, you know, I, I'm familiar with the problems that people face when they're sort of you know, and and you know, one of one of my jokes is that you know, as wonderful as the Stack Overflows of the worlds are, the first person to answer any question is going to be, why would you want to do that in the first place? And the second one is going to be, well, you just snarf the fizzle and you, and you're done. You know, right, right, right. <laughs> and, 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 well said. Yeah, and the, the thing is that like the, ch the particular challenge, I think, and this is the mistake that like I intuitively make when I think about creating documents like this is that, oh, you just need to get the beginning right. You know, uh, the, you begin with turning on the computer and then there's this thing attached to it called a mouse. And when I say double click, that means take the little pointer, which is the triangle thingy. And, you know, and like it, it A, it's really hard to do without sounding condescending. And B, right. um, you have to do it the whole way. And that's where the real really hard part comes because, and this is what I, what I, I I've never heard it. I think you said that people get, people get dumped by the book, right, uh, which is a right. really great thing. But like, so there you've got this relationship with this book and then all of a sudden, bam, there's this one unfillable gap and you can't progress. And so to do that, to do that successfully for a whole book from, because you're not just assuming from the beginning that, that like they don't know anything, you don't know they don't know or whatever. You have to, you have to be keeping that in mind all the way along. Right. And it's interesting to, to listen to you describe like how, how do you begin because that's a challenge as well, because you can't begin with turn your computer on, press that button that looks like it. Um, but you can't just say install Python. Um, and so finding finding that line of what exactly needs to be shared in how much detail, and then what to tell people if they get off track. Um, one of my reactions back in 2013 was to a book um, that basically intentionally left things confusing and told people to go look them up. And it's pretty interesting to say as an author, what what do you tell people if they don't, if they get stuck? Uh, you can't tell them all to email you. You can't tell them all to go to Stack Overflow. Um, so um, I, my thinking has always been, one of my goals is to let people lean on me while they're learning. So basically say like, if you're start my book, I'll, I'll carry you through this far. 
um, but also not make people depend on me or depend on my book. So the goal is that they are part of the larger programming community. And so I encourage people to um, go to a number of different communities and forums and resources um, when they're asking general questions and, and when they're asking deeper questions. Um, and what I try to watch for, if I'm ever just dumping people back into the community for the community, for the community to support my book, then I'm taking it, doing it wrong. And so I, you know, <laughs> I've had numerous conversations recently about how much more work this book is than people realize. Like I work 10 to 20 hours supporting Python Crash Course every week on average. So this is something um, that I'm, I'm, I was actually really looking forward to talking to you about, and I'm really glad you brought it up. Um, uh, but sure. just before, because like this managing the community that grows around a, a book, and particularly um, mm -hmm. a, a, what's called it in the jargon a prescriptive nonfiction book, is actually like mm -hmm. a really fascinating thing. Uh, one, one, and like I'm just going to say this as a joke into the way of my next question, which before before we get to all this, which is there are a lot of authors who actually can handle being emailed emailed by all their readers. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that my meaning. But, yes. Um, uh, but anyway, but related to that, so uh, you had the experience of, so you were, you were teaching and then you decided to write this book in the time that you could get, get it together. And I know there's a whole story around that about how long yeah, yeah. stuff like that and it always takes longer than you think. Yes. But you, you, you wrote it, you finished it, you published, it was published by No Starch and then it became this big hit. And uh, what was that like when, when the sales started to take off? Oh boy, it's interesting because um, when I was writing it, I knew it could be good. I also was aware of how much time I was putting into it and how much my family was giving up my time with them. And so I had a vision that it, or a goal that it would be one of the, the main Python books for the next 10 years. Um, and my plan was just to produce the best book I could when it was released and then fanatically pay attention to feedback, not reviews, uh, review, reviews are a minefield, uh, but feedback. So emails, uh, communications, um, and just constantly make the book better. And so I had done that. Um, it was interesting when it was first released, um, it was a really quiet period after that because it's out there and you know, I'd get questions about chapter one and then like a few questions about chapter three and like, wow, you can kind of see the first wave of people working through the book. Um, and then as it started to uh, become like the go-to Python book, um, yeah, the it became a second job again. So it was definitely a second job writing it. Um, and then keeping track of people's questions, um, developing resources to go along with the book uh, to support people in their learning. Um, to explain a little bit more about that, I would, I always try to notice when people, go ahead. I said, please, yeah, yeah, I'm very, yeah. very interested in this. When people are writing to me, um, if somebody asks a question that I've never been asked before, okay, I'll answer that person. Um, and a lot of times that happens because they have some unique aspect of their system or something they tried to do that they got into a really weird edge case. Um, but if I start to get multiple people writing in about the same thing, then I need to either clarify what's in the book or put out some kind of update or something like that. Um, and so that's how I manage um, most of the, like my email is still manageable um, because I've kind of steered people towards the online resources when I have something there that, that answers their question. And so when you say put out an update, so um, just to be clear for sort of maybe regular listeners sure. who are familiar with LeanPub, we're not, we're not actually talking about uh, an updatable ebook here. We're talking about a, a print right. that you were then, you then had resources that you were every day kind of maintaining online. Like was it a website or something like that? Yeah, there's, there's um, online resources where people can access the code and solutions and the cheat sheets and, and um, things like that. Um, but also, you know, with a print book, well, with Python Crash Course, there's a new printing every three to six months. Oh, and that so often. each time. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and each time it gets a new printing, I have the chance to submit minor updates. And you can't change the book. You can't rewrite a chapter. You can't, the, the guiding principle is nothing that would change the index. Uh, and nothing changed the spirits, the spirit of the book. 
Um, but if there are either mistakes um, or uh, a library has changed, um, if I can manage to correct that in the book without restructuring the book, then I get to do that. And so, you know, the the first edition ended up going through, I think, 11 printings. And that 11th printing was a very different book than the first printing. Um, not in spirit, not in what people get out of it, but as far as if you put them side by side, you couldn't, you kind of couldn't go through the first printing without running into trouble. But the, the last printing was still working all the way through. Yeah, and just to be clear, anyone anyone interested in buying the book should get the latest. Make sure you get the latest edition um, of Python Crash Course. Currently, it's the second edition, I believe. It is, and it's it's something that's worth saying. And if you're in the tech world, it feels like you don't need to say that. But for people who are just starting programming, they aren't aware of what a first edition and second edition means. A lot of people think a second edition is like a second volume, um, and they're not aware of the updating that goes into a tech book. Uh, in the last part of the interview that we keep for the very last, um, if the guest is a LeanPub, it has, has been using LeanPub in one way or another, we always like to ask them a little bit about, about that experience. Um, I was wondering, just to, to ask you, how, did you, do you remember how you heard about LeanPub as a potential platform for the cheat sheets? Oh, boy. Um, I have been writing since high school. Um, and so I've always paid attention to things related to writing. And so I heard about LeanPub around the time it was it was um, introduced, um, following the you know physical bookstore to digital bookstore to Amazon to um, things like Books a Million Closing to eBooks to online publishing platforms has been really really interesting. And so sorry, um, so uh, I did the cheat sheets. I put them together over the course of a summer, um, just on the idea it would be something that would support people in, in working through their first uh, Python learning resource. Um, and then I stopped being able to update them because I just made them in Word originally and converted to PDF and that is just a mess. So I wanted to update them, but doing it properly was going to be a, a lot of work. And when I finally did it, it was, it was a month of full-time work. Um, and so I was in this weird space of having a commitment to keep them free, but also wanting some opportunity for people to pay for that work. Um, and so I looked at the, the different um, platforms for hosting digital content. Um, and LeanPub, I mean, I'll just say it, it looked brilliant when I compared it to um, the other platforms, just that, that idea of here's what's being offered, here's a brief description, here's a detailed, and the slider. Right? The slider interface is just, it's beautiful. Um, because, okay, specifically for this case, I want people to know that it's free. I want people to know the price that I think is fair if they can pay for it. Um, and I like them to know what that breakdown is as far as you know, particularly in this case where they could have it for free, you know, people who are going to choose to pay for that are only wanting to do that because they're supporting my work. Um, and so that slider makes all of that really clear. And it's so much different than a button that you just click and say, I will click the free button. Like it's, it's just as quick almost to get the free one if you need it or want it. Uh, but it's a momentary pause to think about all that goes into creating these resources. Yeah, thanks very much for the kind words um, and, and for saying that. It's, it's really interesting, actually. Um, there were some uh, people who were behind one of the world's most successful MOOCs um, about data science. And one of the reasons they came over to LeanPub for some of their resources was precisely ex exactly the same thing. We've got this global educational resource basic reach and we've got some extra materials and we would like to give people the op people, we would like people to have the opportunity to provide us with some you know, some money if they, if they want to, but the really, it was so important to them that the, the, there was a big word free with an exclamation point there, along with the opportunity to actually, to actually spend some money on it as well. And, you know, the, the, one of the things, the lessons we've learned over the years is that like books with a free minimum price can be the most 
can make the most money. Uh, and right. it, it's partly right. because it's, it's establishing, I like to put it in kind of romantic terms, but like it's establishing a different kind of relationship from the kind the typical one, like you described, right? Where it's like typically there's a buy button. Well, in this one, we actually have this, this slider, as you're talking about, there's a, there's two, right? Typically there's one on top right. that says you pay. And there's the other one right. on the, underneath it says author earns. And a lot of people, and this is old lean pub going back to the beginning, but you know, when mm-hmm. we first introduced them, people were paying strange prices and it was because they were right. dragging the author's earns thing. That's right. deciding how much to pay. And, yep. and when, when we very often have people who like get something for free, check it out and then come back and buy it, you know, mm-hmm. if they think it's worth it. And so, and it's, it, yeah, a, a lot of it, a lot of it is about, and a lot of work has gone into that slide part right. of the page over the years, but the, um, is about, is about genuinely establishing this relationship. Like you're not just paying, you're not just paying it out there. You're paying it to the person. They're going to get it. And here's how much they're going to get from what you pay. And that's just very important to, to us. Yeah. Well, when you talk about this, um, arc of publishing for, um, physical bookstores to eBooks to um, independent publishing to uh, digital platforms. Um, it is so clear that LeanPub equally respects readers and authors. Um, and that's all clear right in that interface. Well, that's, that's very, I'm very glad to hear that. Cause that's, that's what we're, that's exactly what we're aiming for. Um, and yeah. the, so the, the last question that, we always like to ask uh, if the guest is, has been using LeanPub is um, if there was one thing we could fix for you that you really bugs you or one thing we could build for you, uh, what would you ask? And you're not allowed to mention packages because I already know <laughs> <laughs> our first interaction was, um, was uh, Eric found a bug with the way our packages were working. So we already know that that's one thing we could improve for you. Right. Um, yeah. And to be really clear, uh, my question was answered really quickly and really effectively. And so uh, it just got me more into the platform. Um, I think I found that bug because you all have built a platform that is flexible. Um, So the idea I think originally was to support authors writing books um, and help them reach an audience before the book is is finished. but it turns out it's really good for things like cheat sheets, which are not a book at all, a digital good, digital document with a similar concept of uh, someone who is creating a meaningful learning resource, um, wanting to connect in a respectful and flexible way with an audience. And so I think that, yeah, I don't, I don't have any specific requests because you guys are clearly paying attention to how your platform is being used and how it can be used. Well, um, if you ever do, please don't hesitate to reach out. You've got, you've got my email. <laughs> um, well, Eric, uh, thank you very much for taking the time today to, uh, to talk to uh, everybody. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks for uh, using LeanPub as a platform for your uh, resources. You're welcome, and I appreciate the invitation, and I sure appreciate what you guys have built. Thank you very much. And as always, thanks to all of you for listening to this episode of the Front Matter Podcast. If you like what you heard, please rate and review it wherever you found it. And if you'd like to be a LeanPub author yourself, please check out our website at leanpub.com. Thanks.